All right, everybody, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We're going to take um, the next few Wednesday nights, and, you know, this is a subject that we periodically teach. It's, it's, it's something we, I say periodically, regularly teach. Uh, I would say it's one of the subjects you probably ought to teach at least once a year, if not once every year and a half, um, and is, is referring to the power of the renewed mind. Um, Dad Hagen said that one time, uh, it's probably, you know, of course, he's been gone home to the Lord about nine years now. But um, going on 10 this February, uh, well, it's nine years. The next, next September will be 10 years. Um, but he, in a book he wrote sometime in the 80s or 90s, he said one of the most um, important things or one of the most needed things in the church world today is minds renewed to the Word of God. And I don't think that is any less true now than it was when he wrote that. I think that is an ongoing issue um, with people because you have new babes coming in, new people coming in, and to have their minds renewed to the Word of God is an ongoing process that needs to be regularly attended to. I also think that, um, no, I don't think I really, I believe that if you look through the Word of God, you can, you can see this is, a, this is a truth, that people can have had their minds renewed to the Word of God and then let those things slip and have to re-renew <laughs> their minds to the Word of God. Okay, so it is, an, it, is a, it is an ongoing process from the time you're born again until the time you go to heaven. And I don't know that we won't be doing it in heaven. <laughs> so I can't say, you know, nothing, nothing the Bible says that the day you get to heaven, everything you got it. There's nothing, there's nothing that says that. There's nothing that supports that scripturally. That you, know, you walk into heaven and boom, you got it all. You know? So, uh, praise the Lord. All right. Romans chapter 12. We'll read verses 1 and 2. It says here, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So Paul says here, um, you know, in the first verse here, and he says that he asked them to present their bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. Now that, that word reasonable um, could just as easily have been translated spiritual service. It is a spiritual service to keep, present your body. You know, Paul writes in one place that says this, he says, I keep my body under. I buffet my body daily. He did not say I buffet my body daily. He says I buffet. <laughs> All right, I know, I know some people like that, that translation of I buffet it every day better, but it's not accurate. He buffets his body. In other words, he keeps it under, controls the flesh. And if you'll study Scripture, we find that in dealing with the flesh, we, we control it. That is, that, is the, that is what the believer has to do. You have to control its appetites. Submit yourselves to God. The Bible teaches us to not yield our members as servants of unrighteousness. Paul here says, offer your body a living, in other words, not killing it, but a living sacrifice. In other words, there's a constant ongoing thing where you've got to keep your body sacrificed to walk out the will of God, and it's a spiritual service in doing so. <clears throat> so here he tells us that the dealing of the body, and in other scriptures also, the, uh, it is maintaining control of it. You don't let it do what it wants to do. You tell it, no. You say, no. And then you smack it if it keeps on going. <clears throat> Amen. You could tell yourself, don't go back to the buffet bar for the 45th time today. You know, you can stop at three quarters of a pie instead of the whole pie. <laughs> Amen. Really, you should stop way before you get there. You know, that's why we have a numerous scriptures, and a lot of things are said uh, to us about being temperate and all things and said is really the, the dealing with keeping the body under control. But then he moves on to the next one, says, and be not conformed to the world. Now, the word conformed here comes from a Greek word that means to be fashioned or molded to. Okay, to be shaped um, in, in, in re relationship to. So don't be, don't be shaped, don't be molded to the world. Now, how many of you when something's in a mold? It takes the shape of the mold. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You, you, go, you go over here and you go to somebody who made a pretty cake, made a pretty Cinderella cake. They did not get that Cinderella cake just by pouring the, this batter out on something and sticking in the oven. They poured it into a mold. 
you know Janie had this um had a mold for it, the, the big bell dresses okay and then and then she could put the plastic things on top you know and everything but it, it had all the pattern in it and all this stuff so when she baked it and dumped it out all she did was ice it and, and then and color it and stuff but it started out it was molded it was fashion you get starfish things you, what you pour them in a starfish mold you get these cookies that are different shapes you know um, you just didn't dump the plop of dough up on the tray and go for it it went into a mold in other words when you're molding something you're, something's poured into a mold and it takes the shape of it. Paul here says, don't be conformed, don't be molded, don't be poured into the world's mold. Okay? And so another one else. If he's telling us not to, then we can be. If he's telling us not to, we can be. Just because you're born again and under the dispensation of grace does not mean you won't be conformed to the world. God tells you, don't be. Didn't say, you got saved. You don't, you're never be, you'll never be conformed to the world again. That's not what it says. It says, don't be. And then he goes on and tells you how not to be. Look here. He says, do, and be not conformed to the world. Don't be poured in and fashioned and shaped according to the world or to this world, but be ye transformed. In other words, so you understand um, a thesis or a theatrical, a theatrical statement and an antithetical statement? In other words, you have a thesis here. The thesis is don't be conformed to the world. The, the, antith uh, the antithesis is be transformed. So in other words, there is a, a, a command not to be something, and then there is the command to do something. Yeah. The not will take place when you do. Yeah. Okay? And that's what Paul says here. He gives, he gives a thesis, don't be conformed to the world. All right? But be ye transformed. Now, the word transform comes from a really cool Greek word. Uh, you'll, you'll rec you will recognize the root word of it for an English word when I say it. It comes from the Greek word metamorpho, which is where we get the English metamorphosis. Very good. We get the English metamorphosis from this Greek word metamorpho. Okay, so he says here, don't be shaped, fashioned, molded according or to this world, but have a metamorphosis. How? By the renewing of your mind. Now listen, this is not the new birth. This is not the new birth. The new birth is not a process. It's an instant, it's an instant act, it is an instant event. Amen? When you call on, when you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God's raised from the dead, you're saved, you're born again. Amen. The minute you accept Jesus as Lord, you're born again. That is not a process. Your spirit is transformed or, or, or actually passes from death unto life. You're born of God. Your spirit becomes born of God. You become what we refer to as born again. You are born of the Spirit of God. That's an instant right then thing. But we find out here you got to do something with the body. You, gotta, you got to what? Offer as a living sacrifice. And now we find out that even though you're born again and you're keeping that body under, you can't be conformed to the world. And the way you stop being conformed to the world is to have a metamorphosis or something. What is it? Ha and, be, and have a transformation or metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind. This is not in reference to the pneuma of the man. Your mind must be renewed. Then he says that you may prove was that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. So we have here... We have the um, Paul laying out to the believer here that although you're born again and you're a Christian, and if you go back earlier in Paul's writings, in actually this same book, back over in 6 through 8, he talks about not yielding the members and all this kind of stuff, and he deals with a lot of that stuff. And he doesn't just kind of just drop themes. Understand the epistles were written to the church so they could grow and mature 
and be found complete in Christ so they could be found mature in Christ so they wouldn't uh, continue to live as babes in Christ. Amen. Paul writes to the, uh, in the book of Hebrews, I, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, and says that when you, had the need, when, you, when you should be teaching, you have need of milk again. That was not a compliment. Hello. All right. So he says, and, and we, can, we can nix the uh, AC now. I think it's cooled off. And I, I'm seeing people growing icicles out there. But it really does feel good up here. It kind of, Hallelujah. Paul lets us know the body has to be offered as a living sacrifice. But then he, he makes that statement here about not conforming to the world. Now, now Kenyon, E.W. Kenyon in his writings made this statement. And I read this a long time ago. And it always kind of stuck me before I kind of really got a revelation of this. But it always kind of struck me harsh. And, and I don't mean uh, I disagree with it. It just kind of one of those stark statements. It's got to go whack. He said Christians who don't renew their minds to the word of God will imitate sinners. Christian, that, that, was a, that, was a, that was a Kenyanism, all right? Kenya said, Christians who do not renew their minds to the Word of God will imitate sinners. Wow. Well, isn't that what he just said here? Yeah. He said, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What happens if you don't renew your mind? You'll be conformed to the world. Yeah. Yeah. You'll act like the world acts. Now, you've seen carnal Christians. How many of you have ever seen a carnal Christian? Yeah. You know, they came in, they got born again, they, loved, they, they said they loved the Lord, but they don't ever renew their, they, they don't stay in a place where they get taught. They don't renew their mind, and they keep living according to their flesh. Their flesh dictates everything they do. Their flesh tells them what to do. Why? Well, that's what the world conformity is. The world is governed by its flesh. <clears throat> look at the events. Uh, look at the, the, um, the culture. Forget anywhere else in the world. I don't really get, care um, to compare the United States to any other culture. I'm just talking about our culture right here. Let's talk about our culture right here. What we grow up, what we deal with on a daily basis. What Europe's doing, you don't deal with, so it's kind of hard for you to relate as much. But right here in the United States, think of the cultural change. When did abortion become such, and I know this has always been abortion. There's always been, you know, people trying to kill the baby and that kind of, I understand that for centuries. But when did it get become an epidemic in this country? Now, R.V. Wade was passed in 73, I think. Is that right? Anybody? Right. 73. <clears throat> that was an ungodly ruling. It was, it, was, it was the court system violating our Constitution and legislating from the bench. Um, I will always believe that until it's overturned and, they, and those people get turned over in their graves. Anyway, but what did that come, what, what cultural um, event was taking place when the popularity of abortion became acceptable? The free sex movement. I mean, the 60s was all about the love child, about had group sex, orgies. I mean, just, it was all about the flesh. It was about sex. People were getting pregnant, and, you know, and it used to be that, you know, a girl could say, no, no, we can't do that because I might get pregnant. Now, now the guy goes, go see Planned Parenthood. I do want a president who will take money away from Planned Parenthood. Yeah. My tax money shouldn't go to help fund Planned Parenthood. Yeah. Because that's not what they are. Yeah. They're playing kill the baby. They're a bunch of <clears throat> godless people. Just saying. They want control. But anyway. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I'm going to get my soapbox. Hallelujah. Mm. Anyway, the, 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 the uh, R.V. Wade ruling and then the explosion of abortion came out on the tail end of a cultural um, transformation of the free sex. Now, that all came out of the drug, the, the hippie, the drugs. I mean, everybody started smoking dope. I mean, our college campuses have been the social experimentation place for decades. The intelligentsia of our nation takes all these kids in there and re brainwashes them into their godless, left-wing, progressive, liberal, stupid, dumb mindsets. If you want to know how I really feel about 95% of the professors in this country. There are some good ones out there, but the majority of them want to train them into being liberal brain skulls full of mush. Anyway, 
Reject everything your parents say. Reject everything that's good. Reject all morality and find yourself. All this cosmic humanism and secular humanism and postmodernism and progressivism and Leninist Marxism and all this crazy mess that goes on all the time, re-brainwashing our kids. And most, and, and, and we start getting into some of the hum humanistic stuff, so particularly cosmic humanism, which is big, big in, the, in, in those cultures is uh, finding your inner God. There's, there's nothing, there's no limit to you. The more you find yourself, the more you express yourself, the more God you become. Okay? Cosmic humanism is a bunch of looney tunes. They must have been dropping acid. All right? <clears throat> but I'm saying this because that cultural change in America took place where abortion became so accepted because it came with people just absolutely giving in to their, their carnal sexual appetites. Everywhere. I mean, perverse, perverse stuff. I mean, you, you, you go back and you read some of the stuff that went on in the 60s, and I mean, they were having, well, everybody's old enough to sexual orgies where they were urinating on each other. That was, that was encouraged. That's sick. <laughs> Jeff went, ugh. <laughs> you go do some studies of, of, of the stuff that went on that, in that era. It was just perverse. That's weird. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just, you got to have a demon in your head to think that's cool. But that, that's, and see, right out of that, right on the t and I know I'm going on the internet, people can be going, my God, I can't believe, well, this is what happened. So we had that, tra we had that transformation, and the thinking against abortion transformed, and it became accepted. When man could try to control a woman's body, I got the right control body. That's not fetal tissue, that is a child yeah. in you. <clears throat> Okay. <clears throat> now homosexuality, this ongoing, ex, you know, taking, you, know, you understand every time you sin, and we know this about, we know this about drugs. Drugs is really a, a, a microcosm in a short period of time of the effects of sin long term. In other words, when, you know, drugs or alcohol, anything that, you know, you're chemically dependent upon for pleasure, for, for, for feeling better. We know this, that when people start drinking, they could probably drink half a, half a, 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 um, a near beer when they first start drinking and get a buzz. But then after a while, they got to drink a case. I had a grandfather who took commissary beer, black label commissary beer, and drank it from morning to night. We just said he was pickled. I think he was pickled. You know, um, drugs. The first time somebody smokes some, smokes some reefer, the next time it's got to be a little bit more. The next time it's got to be a little bit more. It finally gets where they got to smoke a bunch just to get a high. And that's why they're always looking for a, a stronger drug because you got to do more and more and more to get higher and higher and higher. Well, out of the sexual revolution, and I, and I say the sexual assassination that took place in this country, people had to get more and more perverse sexually. And so now, where 30, 40 years ago, if we had talked about, you know, um, um, accepting homosexual marriage in this country, it would have, it, people, no way it'll ever happen. And then we've got states that already have done it, have already passed it. It's a battle all the time. We've got politicians trying to make all the homosexuals happy. Where'd that all come from? It came out of the flesh and the world is a and I said all this for the purpose of making the statement the world is governed by their flesh yeah. now listen we're in a presidential election what is it that everybody keeps pointing to to try to win the election it is making people's flesh happy we don't we don't we don't vote and, and as a majority of this country will not vote morally and I'll be on Republican or Democrat, what are they all talking about? The economy. What's good for me financially? Who's going to be do the better job of making me happy financially? You're voting according to your flesh. Hello? Instead of voting morally and righteously. You as a Christian have a responsibility to put your flesh under and vote morally and responsibly according to the Word of God. Bottom line, which candidate has moral code and moral representations that are biblical? 
not going to make sure I got some money or that what they do is going to get me a raise next year. Listen, I want an economic, I would love to see an economic turnaround in this country, but I'm telling you, I will not vote based on that. I will vote based on who stands righteously before God and what their policies are in relationship to biblical issues. I will not vote for a candidate who's pro-abortion. I don't care what letters behind their name. I will not vote for a candidate who's pro-homosexual. I don't care what, what, what letters behind their name. Why? Because I am not voting according to what's good for me and my flesh. And, you know, if, if, I, if one of the candidates was better on the economic issues than the other, but they were pro-homosexual and pro-abortion, I would not vote for them. And will not vote for them. Why? Because killing babies and marrying homosexuals is ungodly. Yeah. And it's a violation of the Word of God. Yeah. And so I, I am not going to do things to promote an ungodly nation. Yeah. Yeah. I will not do it. I will not do it. And there's no other reason. There's no other reason for a Christian to vote one way or the other than doing what the Bible would have you do. The people rejoice when the righteous reign. Yeah. That's what the Word of God says. The people rejoice when the righteous reign. All right? But we have such a culture in our country of the flesh. I mean, you got politicians, I'm talking Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever party, it doesn't matter what party it is. You got politicians who are trying to get uh, marijuana legalized. You got politicians who are trying to make sure that, you know, if you vote for them, that you, you believe that you're, you're going to have all the money you'll ever need. You're going to have a new home. You're, you know, everything's going to be hunk of dory. And, and the reality of it is, um, we, don't, we, don't hear, we don't hear discussions about abortion and homosexual marriage um, out there. And one more point, who stands with Israel? Yeah. That's a biblical issue. Yeah. All right? So, yeah. as a Christian, I can't, I can't go any other way. I'm not going to let a cultural appeasement of sin cause me to vote one way or the other. And this is what we're talking about. Be not conformed to this world. We can't think like the world thinks. Yeah, but if I vote for them, I, I, I might have to, I, I might lose this or I might lose that. And are you willing to pay the price for that to see another 1.5 million babies aborted this next year? Or the possibility of having, listen, our military now has to, has to get, the guys have to go into this and fight battles with people who are openly homosexual. They have, because that don't ask, don't tell has been overturned, been, been kicked out. I shouldn't have to wonder, you know, about the guy next to me when I'm fighting what he's thinking. Hello. I'm going to stop. Well, I can't. But see, understand, be not conformed to this world. The world is governed by their flesh. If people were not, listen, if women were not engaged in sex, and men obviously have to be involved, but, 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 the, but the man has no control over the abortion issue. If women were not engaged in sex outside of marriage, you wouldn't see 1.5 million abortions a year. Okay. Bottom line. Okay. Bottom line. Well, the case of uh, incest and rape, that accounts for less than 2%. And if you want to take it up higher, 5% of all abortions. Health, rape, or incest. Less than 5%. It's actually less than 2%. Well, 2% of 1.5 million is a whole lot less than 1.5 million. That means the other million, 200,000 were just because people just didn't want to pay the price for, for engaging in activity outside of marriage. Well, what do I do if I made the mistakes? Repent, ask God to forgive you. But, don't, but, but understand, you, we cannot let people keep going that direction and not say something. You need to tell your children, don't do what I did. Yeah. Don't make the mistakes I made. Listen, I've taught my kids, look, don't, don't do this. I, I made mistakes when I was growing up. You don't want to follow that path. You know? We've all, we've all done things when we were younger before we got saved that were wrong, and we don't want our kids to follow on that same path. Isn't that right? Well, we have to teach them. Now, I'm, set up, I'm, I'm doing all this to set the cultural situation. We're living in a culture that is governed by its flesh. And people a lot of times just haven't been taught any better.
Amen. People haven't even taught any better. When you come into the church and learn something's wrong, let me say something. When I teach certain things and I say certain things, and I know I come strong. I mean, if you were, if you, if you were uh, pregnant outside of marriage or if you were, um, you were living in homosexuality or if you were smoking dope and shooting up and dropping acid or whatever we're talking about, um, that's, you ought to be the first person to say, yeah, that's right. I don't want my kids to go through that and I shouldn't keep going through that. You should be the first person. Don't get mad at me. Understand, we're talking about changing a cultural mindset. Yeah. Well, how do we do that? We have to renew it to what the Word of God says. Yeah. And the Word of God tells us a lot to do with our flesh. Yeah. Amen. There's a lot of things we're told to do with our flesh. One, you know, Paul says, don't yield as a member of unrighteousness. Look, look kind of hold your place here in Romans. I, I'm going to... Now, okay, let me say this. If we're to be conformed by the renewing of our mind, the transformation by the renewing of our mind, that means we read what the Word of God says and let it change the way we think. Isn't that right? And if what the Word of God says changes the way we think, that means we've got to make adjustments. Isn't that right? <clears throat> now, if we back up over here, I'll say in the Romans, um, let's see, I want to see if it's six, six or eight. Um, You know, Romans 6. And then you can say this. Verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's Paul's rhetorical statement to the people who think they can keep on doing whatever they want to do because they're covered in grace. God forbid. All right. Let's get over here. Um, Oh, verse 10. For in the, in the he died, he died in the sin once, but in the he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed in the sin, but alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members, that's your body. All right? We don't have to get graphic here, but you don't yield your body members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Now, now this is that statement where the idiot came to one pastor one time, and, and they were having relationship problems. He said, well, you know, I, I understand you're living together, and you're not married. That's probably why you've got problems. And they said, oh, no, pastor, we're under grace. That doesn't matter. That's not what Paul said. That's not what Paul said. Now, let, let's go on. Know ye not, this, this, this is why this is important, folks. Here, as your pastor, and as a pastor here preaching to you on, on the internet, I want you to be successful. I want you to have victory. I want you to overcome. So I'm not going to placate you and tell you that you can do anything you want to and get away with it and it's okay with God. Why? Because listen to this next verse. He tells you not to yield your members as instruments of uh, uh, unrighteousness, but as instruments of righteousness unto God. And, th and then it says, don't, uh, uh, sin shall not lord over you. Verse 15, what then shall we continue in your sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Um, verse 16, know ye not. Know ye not. Here's the, key, here's the, right, the reason. That to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Sin is destructive. Sin will hurt you. Sin will bring calamity. Now, God, will, listen, you can ask God to forgive you and God will forgive you. But shall we continue any longer? Once you've recognized, I'm going to tell you something, folks. Some of us need to just stop and step back and go, you know what? I was wrong. What I did was wrong. I've got a situation now. I asked God to forgive me. I'm going to go forward. But I ain't going to be living like this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And stop. Yeah. Because the Word of God, why? Because sin will kill you. Yeah. Sin will destroy you. Sin is destructive. It is not productive. It is destructive. It will hurt you in the long run. It will rob you. Yeah. Now, I'm going to say something. I'm going to be real blunt. Our government has set up a system that encourages sin. 
It does. People who are, who've gotten pregnant out of wedlock and if, if they're on government su substance, if they want to get married, they lose. The government should encourage the marriage for the sake of the children. I mean, if, I mean, if the government's going to do anything to help, they should help provide a two-parent household Amen. instead of robbing it and saying, no, if you, if you get married, you're going to lose your, any, any government help. That, that's, that is encouraging sin. That's, encur that's, that's robbing people of the ability to, to do, in some cases, the right thing that they would like to do. But if I do that, the government's going to take my money, and I won't be able to make it. I won't be able to feed my children. See, and we get into that whole quandrum. That's why we just need to do the things the way the Bible says do them. Yeah. Now, I'm going to speak to you. If you're in a situation where you've gotten yourself in a tough hole and a tough pickle, repent, ask God to forgive you. God will help you. If you put your trust in him, God will help you, and God will bring you out. But you've got to put your trust in him. Yeah. And you've got to start doing the right things. Amen. 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 But I, I, that, that's what irritates me about our government so often. It encourages sin. It's just like it encourages people to be uh, um, captured in the entitlement world. Do you, I mean, I mean, I mean, some of you may not know this, but people who are, uh, who, are in, who are living in government subsidized housing, if they get to a certain income level, they can't stay. Let me tell you what, that income level is not enough to leave the subsidized and go out on your own. You can't make, you can't bridge, you can't jump the bridge. It's not enough money. So, so if you've got a job and you're getting up to where you're making enough money, uh, by the time you really start to make enough money to start getting ahead and get to the place, they say you can't keep staying here because you're making too much money. But if they go out, what happens? They fall short because they can't make the next jump to the other housing, regular housing. That is an evil system. Because it keeps people bound. It's not godly. It's bondage. I said it's bondage. It's not right. It's not right. The government, I mean, listen, if somebody's out making money, they ought to make sure. I mean, if you're going to help them, help them. And not buy, put them in bondage. Don't, don't put people in bondage. It's ungodly. It's not right. People are trying to, trying to get ahead. And the government says, you know, well, and, and the reason is, you got to understand, there's a lot of politics that want to keep people in certain places so they can control them. And I don't, I, I just, it, it just, it aggravates the daylights out of me. Back over here. 16. Know ye not to whom you yield your members, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Think about that. Now, he goes on says, But God be thanked that you were servants of sin, but ye obeyed the heart and the former doctrine which was delivered to you, being made then free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now, let me say something. You can yield yourself right back into unrighteousness. We all know that. We've all done it. I've met, I, I got this, um, and I knew this guy. This guy was a great guy. He got and saved, turned on to the Lord. He'd had a lot of issues, but he, I mean, he really got, I mean, this guy got born again. Radical for Jesus. Him, him, and, him and his wife, I mean, well, they got married. They were, they were in my home church we came out of. Loved the Lord. He actually ended up being a minister at the church. But one day he was riding down the road and this guy was hitchhiking. He picked him up and the guy got in the car and um, they were riding down the road. And he offered him some, some um, I, I, think, I think he offered him some marijuana. The guy used to smoke dope. That's why you got to keep your, that's why you, Paul said, I buffet my body daily. It is not a one and done deal. Yeah. Buffeting your body is not a one and done deal. Y'all hear? Have you heard me? Buffeting your body is not a one and done. You don't do it one, you don't buffet it one day and that's it. You never have trouble with it again. Now see, growing up classical Pentecostal, we used to go to the altar and we would pray until we got wholly sanctified. And we thought, man, when I, I thank the Lord, I've been saved, sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that I hold true to the end. Now it's amazing how many of them sanctified folk was unsanctified acting. Yeah, I prayed the Lord I had that experience of getting sanctified. Uh, honey, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. All right, the particular, the particular Pentecostal denomination I was believed in is a second definite work of grace. Uh, some of the other Pentecostals believe it's an ongoing process. They, well, this Pentecostal holiness believe it's, they came out of the Nazarenes. The Nazarenes believe in second, sanctification as a second definite work of grace. The, the PH split off from the Nazarenes over the issue of speaking in tongues. 
the assemblies of God believe in sanctification as an ongoing process, which is very accurate. Okay? When you get born again, you are separated, but you got to deal with that flesh daily. All right? Well, how do we do that? We do that by renewing our mind. We're transformed by the renewing of the mind. Why? If you go in some churches and they tell you, say, it doesn't matter what you do with your flesh, God doesn't care, you're born again, you're under grace, and then they come read Romans 6, there's a problem. Is there not a problem? He commands them not to yield their bodies as members of unrighteousness, as servants of unrighteousness. Why? Because it'll kill you, it'll hurt you, it's destructive. It's destructive. Listen, dope smoking Christians, you're going to get to heaven quicker than the rest of us. Drinking Christians are going to get there faster. Hello? Shooting up Christians will get there faster because they're going to kill themselves. Hello? I know that, 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 I'll give you, let me give you an extreme case. I know we, we talk a lot about sexual things. Why? Because that is, you understand this. We're, we're old enough in here to understand this. Sexual appetites are the strongest human appetite. Yeah. It is the strongest driving force in the human flesh. It just, that's the way it is. I know people don't like to talk about it in church, but we got to talk about it. There is a, and listen, God created sex for man and woman to come together and be one flesh and to procreate in the bonds of matrimony. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Okay? It is... It is for procreation. It is for intimacy between a husband and wife. The world has tried to, and, and has done a very, very good job, strip the morality and the God side. In other words, relegate man to simply a physical being with sexual appetites, ex uh, um, removing the soul and the spirit out of the equation so that now it's just an animalistic practice for, for physical pleasure. Okay? It is a driving force. There are people who go crazy. We, we think people, men, men rape women. They just, they, they got to have that, that feeling. Are you here? Molest children. It's driving. It's demonic. Taking something that God intended for good, Satan has perverted it into a driving appetite. We have to control our flesh. It just, it's just part of, of life. You have to control your flesh. Paul even wrote and said, listen, listen how strong even in the Bible, talked about that those who could not maintain a celibate, a celibate lifestyle need to marry so they wouldn't burn. That's pretty strong language. Now, King James, if I got a modern translation, it'd be stronger than that. It's kind of like, a, I know some people think, my God, I can't believe I came to church tonight. Pastor Ed was all over this. Well, you didn't hear this in high school. And you didn't hear it in the eighth grade. Hello. No, in high school, they tell you how to have birth control and how to go see Planned Parenthood now. And they don't have to tell the parents. They can give out contraceptives and they don't have to tell the parents. I'll smack you. Show up around my kids. I might take a two by four right to your front of your face. Anyway, send you to Haiti and tell them that you robbed something. Let them cut your hands off. That's how they do it. I tell you what, you don't have a whole lot. People only steal a couple times in Haiti. They cut one hand off the next time. They cut the other hand off the next time. They hang them. You say, how can they steal without hands? Some people figure it out, but they, they, it's, a, it's a three strikes, you're out there kind of issue. Anyway, I like that. <laughs> That's what cuts down on, people, people can leave their purses in their cars. <laughs> All right. Because... Uh, you know, uh, there are things like that, that are such a strong appetite. We have to govern the flesh, and we do that by renewing our mind to what the Word of God says. You cannot forego the morality of life. Somebody say, I don't like you telling me, trying to push your morality off of me. 
Every law everywhere is somebody's morality being pushed off on somebody. Yeah. Every law. <clears throat> you might not like the, the laws that say you can't go kill people. That's, that's somebody else's morality. Hello? There are laws that say that, you know, you can't burn people's houses down. That's somebody else's morality being shoved down your throat. That argument is, is just th those typical arguments they come up with in college and they get real philosophical. You're pushing your morality off on me. Every law on our book, every law in this nation is somebody's morality being pushed down on people. Every single one of them. All right, so let's, let's just leave that behind. The morality of the believer, the thinking of the believer, the lack of being, the not being conformed to the world has to take place from the Word of God renewing how you think. Because yeah. Kenya says you'll imitate a sinner. So, I've met Christians. And I was going to share a story. We had this guy in our church um, a number of years ago. He was married. Um, and um, the first time I saw him, I said, he's married, but I know, I know he's homosexual. I knew it. I mean, I just, like, there is no doubt about it. And uh, finally, he called the church. I was assistant pastor at the church. He called the church one day. He said he, he needed help. I mean, listen, he was engaging in bestiality. I mean, he was just, he got the, more and more perverse. Now, listen, I'm talking about sin killing you. We went and ministered to him, laid hands on him to cast the devil out of him. But as we were ministering to him, the word Lord came. And I spent my, my pastor, um, had confidence in my ability to hear the Spirit of God. And I had a word for him. I said, if you ever go back into homosexuality again, you will die. You just don't say, I didn't have, that's the only person I've ever told that to. Said, if you go back into homosexuality again, you will die. That wasn't God being mad, but that was God giving him a warning. Get your flesh under. Live right. Don't do this again. So, him and, him and the girl, you know, they were there for, and then they moved. And, and, and of course, what happened was he went back into it uh, in about a year, a year and a half. He went back into that lifestyle. He left her. They divorced. About five years later, he called one of the, the, one of the men that came that day. It was pastor, myself, and another minister in the church. Um, and this, and, and this, the reason the other guy came because they had gone to some, the same Bible school um, in Raleigh. And that's how they met. That's how they, that's, this couple ended up in our church. The other couple with a homosexual man, a husband ended up in our church. They were, you know, and they, homosexuals in Bible school? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He left her. Five years later, he called back this guy and said, um, I, I want you to know I'm dying. I have full-blown AIDS. But I have gotten right with the Lord. And, um, you know, and it wasn't long after he died. I mean, he had, he, he had full-blown. What did the Lord tell him? Control your flesh. Stop this. It will sin kills. The Lord told him that so he, wouldn't, he didn't have to die. Or did God judge him? No, he judged himself. By engaging in the activity that got him in that situation. And that's a horrible death. People just waste away to nothing. People waste, you know, and, and, and we're, we're thankful to God that he repented and got right before he died. But God didn't intend for him to die at that age. He was young. He was in his in 30s. Died because he would not quit the sin. Cost him his life. Even with the word of the Lord warning him. Well, I, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't believe God would do that. Listen, Brother Hagin was one time, there was this guy in class. And he saw the cloud of death come over and sit right over top of him. He stopped and said, uh, the, 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 the cloud of death's over. You come see me. He said, come see me three times and you'll live and not die. And after class, the students asked him, what are you going to do? He said, I ain't going to go see him. And he died. Saw the cloud of death over him. We can be, people can get so consumed with their flesh, they don't care. The spiritual things become so distant to them. That's why he says, renew your mind. Be transformed by renewing your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. I did not mean to go this way tonight, but for some reason I'm over there. You might think you're getting away with something. You ain't getting away with it. Dear Lord. There are 
women didn't run around with women. Women run around with men. They ain't married to somebody else's husband, somebody else's wife. And they think, you ain't getting away with nothing. You ain't getting away with it. I'm not pointing at Bill, I'm pointing at the camera. <laughs> Blue's going, what? <laughs> Probably like, Jamie, I'll kill you. My wife told me, listen, I, I have no problems. My wife told me when we got married, you ever run around on me, I will kill you. They'll forgive me for murder. And I, you know what? I believed her. She got a tomahawk. Anyway, she's Cherokee. You know, I just, I just, just that look in her eye that day just kind of did it for me. It was a look. You know, a woman can get a look. <laughs> it, it was, I'll cut you. <laughs> I'll hurt you. All right. So if we're going to renew our minds to the Word of God, then when the Word of God says something, if you, listen, if you're, going to, if you're going to control the flesh, remember the previous verse tells them to control the flesh, and we talked about the fact that conformity to the world is being flesh ruled or flesh dominated. Then we're going to have to renew our mind. We're going to have to change the way we think. And this is what irritates me about these churches that come in and just tell people that everything's okay, God loves them just like they are, you don't have to change. That's not biblical. That's not biblical, Benny, is it? You've got to, you've got to make adjustments. There are adjustments that have to be made, and they take place as you feed on the Word of God, and it, you have that metamorphosis of thinking from carnal thinking. Let me tell you something, uh, and we're going to get to more of this. I got eight pages of notes, so we're going to be here for a while, especially with an introduction like this where I didn't get past point one. <laughs> it's, I mean, we're just way, 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 and there's no way to pull it back to point two for tonight. It just ain't going to happen. All right? It just, it just ain't going to happen. We're going to get to the power of transforming the mind, but also we'll get the scriptures to talk about how that the carnal mind is fleshly, earthly. And you know, it actually says this, that the carnal mind is sensual, earthly, devilish. Think about that. If you don't renew your mind, your thinking is earthly, sensual, and devilish. It doesn't mean it's demon-possessed. It means it thinks contrary to the wholesome counsel of God. People say things like this. Well, homosexuals need love too. They need to be set free so they can love right. Yeah. Let's be real. Come on, folks. That man's dead today because he didn't get, he, he didn't, he, he refused to accept full deliverance and went back into a lifestyle that killed him. He needed to love right. He, he had a, it, it, of course, one of those things just kind of look good. So he's adorable. He's a homosexual. You know what? You can look at him and tell. How could she not see it? Just didn't get it. But he could, he could have, if, if he accepted the freedom that was given to him, granted to him, lived right and had her for a wife and been loved on the rest of his life. Sin is destructive. We have, we have young people being killed because they're out doing things they shouldn't be doing. Not just wrong place at the wrong time. If they'd been where they're supposed to be, they wouldn't have been there. Things happen. Things don't just happen because they just happen out of the blue. Things are happening because people are doing the wrong things. They're putting themselves in the wrong place. And the reason is their thinking is earthly, sensual, and devilish. They don't think godly. And you young people don't need to be out roaming up and down the streets at 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't care what I don't care what anybody says. I can do what I want to do. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can do whatever you want to do. And you can die early if you don't watch it. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is the first commandment with promise. Amen. That thou, you know, that thou mayest. Uh, Thank you. Help me out there. I, just got, got, I know I quote it. Live long on the earth. Be well with you and you'll live long on the earth. This is the first commandment we promise. See? Renewing your mind to think. See? Now I know, you, I know your friends say, man, you, you, you a man. You can do what you want to do. You ain't a man. Dear Lord. There's a lot of men out there who still ain't men. That may be 30 years old. They ain't a man yet. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Some of you parents say amen. Your, your buddies are telling you, you, you can get somebody pregnant. You a man. No, you're dumb. 
You can't, you can't even support a cat. You're going to support a baby? That don't want ever be. Can I get one? One. I'm coming back to church. I hear Pastor Ed again. Can I get one of those? <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. I'm trying to find a place to unhook from all this. But just kind of, kind of, kind of came flooding out. I think God's talking to somebody on the internet here at both places. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, I love you. And I'm willing to preach the truth even if you stare at me like you're mad enough to bite my head off. And you don't want to hear what I got to say. I love you. And I'll tell you the truth. Amen.